if I wanted to dislocate his shoulder, I brought him here. Now we've traded that structure for function. But when we are under load, our body keeps like an inventory, an active trade off of like, okay, we're trading off um, structural stability for mobility. And the shoulder is a good example because I can't get my hip over or my foot over my head. Welcome to Barbell Shrugged. I'm Mike Bledsoe here with Doug Larson. We're hanging out here in Encinitas and at, well, we're here at Physical Culture 101, the gym yeah, we yeah. train at most of the time. Thanks to those guys for letting us come hang out. And uh, Jordan and Jordan have come to visit us. That's Jordan Shallow and Jordan Junta. Got These it. guys, uh, they run RX Radio and uh, they're also two chiropractors. So I'm going to let you guys talk about yourselves a little bit first. So which Jordan wants to go first? Give I'll us your take background. It. I'll take it. Out the floor. Uh, right. Yeah. Dr. Jordan Junta. I'm a chiropractor. Yeah. I've been in practice about two years now. Um, recently, Jordan and myself started the radio channel RX Radio, and our website, our online business is uh, called Prescript, uh, www.pre-script.com, and that's online injury prevention corrective exercise programming. Um, we do personalized programming there. We do um, preset programs, so upper body, lower body stuff to kind of work out some of the common tendencies that you'll see in um, training-related injuries. Um, what, about, what about athletically? What, what's your background? Oh, like how to get into training? And, yeah, you know, What do you do for your training these days? Um, originally, I wrestled the entire first part of my life, first 20 years of my life. Um, some injuries kind of got me out of that, and I still love training. I love strength and conditioning in general. Um, I was doing kind of the, the bro workouts, and that eventually led me into, through an old wrestling coach, into CrossFit. Um, I've been doing CrossFit about six years now. Uh, I've competed at the last four California regionals, once on a team, three times as an individual, and now I'm kind of shifting gears into weightlifting. So that'll be my pursuit in 2018. Nice. Right on. Yeah. Jordan? Yeah. Um I guess we got to stick with doctor. Yeah. Uh, Jordan, Sh oh, my sister's the real Can't let him say doctor and you not say doctor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's going to have one up on me. Uh, <laughs> uh, do uh, Jordan Shallow uh, from southwestern Ontario. So a small town called Windsor, which is basically if you fly uh, south from Detroit, you run into my hometown. Um, so moved out to California. Met this met this joker like um, six, what, six years ago. We've been in practice two years. Yeah. Um, run an office out of Boss Barbell Club in Mountain View, California. So it's kind of a more sought after powerlifting facility through osmosis got into powerlifting um about a year and a half ago and just just took to it like always strength trained um played hockey growing up go figure being canadian about, about to save your life yeah, appreciate oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> flick the spider right off your arm <laughs> see if i would have if i would have saw that i would have passed out <laughs> so that's really good um at least we're in australia just like you said earlier that could be the size of a dinner plate yeah no thanks i'm yeah. good uh, no so grew up playing hockey um you know, you kind of give up the dream if you're not in the NHL by like 16. So I uh, <laughs> just took to lifting weights, skip practice to just hit the gym. And I was a goalie, so um, I had a buddy that was like, hey, why don't you just get really big and you don't have to move? And I was like, yeah, let's, ah. let's try that. Um, so it was kind of a natural <laughs> transition. my style. Yeah, so it was just a, a natural transition, like always squat bench and deadlift, never competitive. Um, then just sort of under the, the guidance of the guy I actually practiced in his gym, Dan Green. Um, Started into it uh, a year and a half ago and just really took to it, and that's kind of my, my go now. So you say you never competed in powerlifting? Uh, no, I've competed five times since. Oh, gotcha. um, yeah, it's been, a busy, it's been a busy two years of competing, pretty much nonstop. Uh, did my first one in Santa Cruz. Um, my second one was Reebok Record Breakers, and then I've done, um, well, in the last three, I got fourth at the U.S. Open, third at the Arnold's in Australia, and I got first at the Reebok Record Breakers that just came by. So, um yeah, for those in the powerlifting circle, 1901 total, 242. So it's, oh, geez. Um, seven, well, best lifts are 727 squat, 441 bench, and a 755 pull. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's kind of me in a nutshell when it comes to, like, the, the lifting part of things. Um, yeah. Started, yeah, RX Radio and Prescript with Jordan. Um, also work at Stanford University as the strength and conditioning coach for the men's and women's rugby team. Mm. Just in my spare time. So, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much a wrap on that. 
Right, so a lot of what you guys do these days are helping athletes stay healthy. If they are injured, you're helping them get back to being, you know, full-time competitive athletes that are healthy, pain-free, you know, joint pain is, is, is managed. Um, did you get a lot of injuries, you know, before you were uh, as experienced as you are now, and, and that's why you got into this, this field, or how, how did you come to really want to help out injured athletes? Yeah, I mean, I got – I had some pretty nasty injuries playing goalie growing up. I mean, I don't have – medial meniscus in either of my knees and it was actually a chiropractor that got me kind of into the field um, but I think the, the pursuit of the career just stems from the lifting um, anything that starts to ache or pain it's like you kind of empathize with people when they come into your office and it's like they're hurt so bad they can't lift and it's like you put yourself in those shoes and it's like I'm not fit to talk to if I if I haven't worked out like I'll fly back to Canada for a day and my mom will like I'll get off the plane it's like six hours and you're dealing with l luggage and all this and well, let's just go to the gym. We'll talk when you get back. I haven't seen her in like a year and a half, and she's like, just go. So I think <laughs> you put yourself in those shoes, and it makes it a, just a different angle from a practitioner standpoint where you can mm -hmm. really kind of um, – the buy-in is there because it's different to say like, oh, yeah, yeah no, uh, that must really suck. But it's another thing entirely to be like, oh, no, I've been there. I've torn this. I've, I've ripped this out. I've had this surgery. And it's like here's not only how you can come back – and lift and here's how you come back and get stronger so i think that's kind of the driving force is like every time we write a program it's like it's like if this guy came to me and was like dude my rotator cuff i was doing whatever crossfit things and I, I <laughs> <laughs> that's how far i've come in two years um and it's yeah, like, i mean i know how you feel I mean, how that is you know yeah. you walk in and you talk to uh cairo a lot of times and you're like oh what do you do for fitness and like oh i cycle once a week yeah I'm like, oh, man, I don't think he understands where I'm coming from right now. Yeah. Yeah. I just think we can always scale it back, right? Like you, you said, like work with athletes. It's like by and large, it's, def it's like define your function, define what your sport is. I mean, life's a pretty unbalanced sport as it is, right? And so we both living in the Silicon Valley have like a lot of experience with patient base of, you know, the nine to five tech crowd. So mm -hmm. – a lot of unbalanced people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <It's laughs> mentally. A lot of hunchbacks <laughs> on the keyboard. Yeah, so but forth. I think if you can tune that stimulus out to a point where you can, you know, you can work with the top end Olympic lifters, you can work with the top end power lifters, you can work with the top end athletes. Anything within that spectrum is is within your capabilities to handle, um, and then it just becomes managing the psychological side and the buy-in. Yeah. What about you? Do you have any nasty injuries back in the day that you that you potentially even still working around? Um, nothing that really lingers. Maybe knock on some wood with that. But um, I've had probably the worst injury, uh, two worst injuries I've had is I tore an MCL wrestling. That's the one that kind of, I'll say in air quotes, ended my wrestling career. But it was more so of a decision that I wanted to take care of my body and just be healthy, be pain free. Um, that's that's what got me away from that. Um, the the worst lifting related injury is I had a, a really bad SI sprain that put me out for probably about eight eight to twelve weeks in that mm -hmm. area. It was bad. It was. Um, it was pretty de debilitating in the beginning stages. You can't really, with low back pain, you, you can't really do much. You can't drive without pain. You can't sit. You can't stand. It sucks to lay down. So um, that was one of the worst injuries that I've had that it took me, and that was in my beginning stages of CrossFit before I was competitive, you know, when I was in that hype of, oh, my God, I need to do everything. If, if I miss a workout, everyone else is getting better, and I'm not um, in that stage. So it, it – really took a toll on me psychologically to not be able to work out for that amount of time um and that was as i was getting into chiropractic school as i was learning about the body and i really in that period started to geek out on movement patterns and how you should be moving and proper technique and things like that um so that i think and then soon soon after that is when i got my crossfit level one and got into the coaching too so all those things kind of came together to get me thinking about how can I prevent this in other people? So that's that's one of the big principles that, that we built prescript on is that how can we help other people not go through the stuff that I've been through? Yeah, yeah I mean, I so. find, I mean, if you want to become an expert at something about the human body, just destroy it. Yeah. And you'll be getting <laughs> yeah. interested Dude, really fast. That's so like true. If you yeah. Love it, let it kill you, man. And that's yeah. why we identify with the athletes that we do because, like, we wear the hat of the clinician, but we wear the hat of the athlete. And I think me and him are more prone to keeping the hat of the athlete on where it's like, you go it on your shield, man. Like, this is the whole point. If you want to win, there's a difference between maximal and optimal. The optimal health, crunchy granola stuff, it's like, sure, there's a market for that. But if you want to if you want to see what your red line is, let's really push the envelope. And then if something happens, we'll rebuild from there. But, like, building the re resiliency and, like, just the ironclad structure from, like, the mobility, stability, strength standpoint, I think t for us so far, it's it's been a really receptive model to the clients yeah. we've worked with. I mean, we're... 15 16 countries now um so it's really been it's really been well received and then that's just 
with the online. I mean, we use the corrective exercises every day in our office with the patients we see one on one. So, mm. and that I think helps kind of control for the intake that you get because it's like, oh, this what I'm seeing in front of me online. I, I know someone that looks just like this. Obviously, different like morphological permutations that are going to differ from person to person. But you know, if you're if you're devising a plan based off of a history and you're planning to get a lot out of that being able to recognize patterns, but be able to put a face like, oh, I have a patient file in my office that literally looks verbatim of what I'm looking at on my screen. Then it's like, okay, what worked, what didn't work? And then start from there. You can start uh, dis like designating values to each movement based off of, it just becomes logarithmic. It's like, okay, I've had to sub this exercise out a few times. I always think that, you know, this particular band of distraction is going to be beneficial for this condition, but they come back and say it's agitating. So I'm going to, I'm going to scrap that. I'm going to push that down the list. And then you just, you, over time, you actually distill out like a, like a better product every time. Like if a, if an automated car gets in a crash, it talks to all the other automated cars and every car gets better at driving. If you just go smash your car into a wall, you're not a better driver. So that's kind of how we work with like doing the back end like data points and actually making the programs better as we go along. So it's like, we try and really cut out the redundancy and the idea, and I think this is something that, I mean, you touched on in the initial st stages of saying like, you know, when you first started CrossFit, it was like more, more, more. And I think dose dependency is something that's so huge in fitness culture in general, right? Like <laughs> fermented foods are great. I'm going to do sauerkraut. I'm going to do kefir. I'm going to do this. Like, oh, really? You live in Korea and Georgia and Germany at the same time? Why are you eating all three of these in one day? It's 2017, man. Right? I'm shipping whole, it from Chile. Because you know? Whole Foods, bro. Because <laughs> Whole Foods. Well, no, and I think <laughs> dose dependency with mobility, and I find it more in the CrossFit realm, but you guys have just swung the pendulum the other way, where powerlifters, like, it was like a tight muscle is a strong muscle, which is <laughs> equally as detrimental. <laughs> so I think what we try to do is we really try and. I just like. It, it's, like in my head, just had like the power lifter walking around. Yeah. Like, yeah. Was, like, I'm not supposed to be able yeah. to tie my I shoes. I can't put my hand yeah. over my head. That'd this, be ridiculous. The single ply fascial suit that they have <laughs> on that they need like 300 to get to depth. I uh, know. I think I we kind of abide by the principle of, you know, addition by subtraction, right? The idea is not to get better at prescript workouts to get better at prescript workouts. The idea is to get better at prescript workouts to get better at squat bench dead, to get better at snatch clean, yeah. handstand walks and, you know, all that stuff too, right? So it's like you find what works, but we really try and instill, like, uh, create an inventory, right? Flip flip tiles where it's, like, find a match. Like, the way we integrate it is, like, we go through progressions of mobility, stability, and strength, but we always integrate, like, some sort of compound movement, some sort of high threshold nervous system load. And that's relative to the condition you have. Like, that high threshold load could be, like, a counterbalance squat with a 10-pound plate. But it's something that's integrating each joint and each muscle we're trying to have a isolated effect on in that warm up from either a mobility or stability or strength standpoint based mm -hmm. off how you present. Because I think a lot of people, you know, they'll do their yoga class and they'll go home. It's like, nah, you need to you need to put a current through that. You need to you've made these transient changes to the nervous system. Like, even if you're foam rolling, you're making you're not making structural changes. I think that's pretty well founded now. And a lot of people in the know are like, no, no, it's, it's transient neural inhibition, right? So with that, we have this new perception. If we load that, then our bodies actually recover when we're not under load because our rev limiter is not our own body weight putting one foot in front of the other. We've been in this transient stable position with 300 pounds on our back. Then all of a sudden when you walk around, it's like, oh, now we're making now we're making changes. My glutes aren't super tight because I've had, I walked out three, three bills and it wasn't an issue. Then when I'm, you know, 265 and I'm walking around, it's like, okay, I can handle this. Then you start to recover then it starts to compound and then you start that addition by subtraction process. Hmm. So you, you've mentioned multiple times that model of mobility, stability, and strength, yeah. you know, uh, how did you come up with that, with that model? And you know, exactly how do you apply that to an athlete that comes to you who's hurt? Yeah, that's just through experience. A lot of it is just simple biomechanics. Um, your joints, my joints, Jordan's joints, Mike's joints, they're, they all work the same, right? It's um, if we're creating force through those joints, there's going to be a better and a worse way to do it. Right? And we're just reinforcing the better ways to do it. So first, we have to be able to move through that entire range of motion. Right? If we're just staying in flexion extension as we do our squats, that's just, okay. That's, that's okay. That's one way to do it. But you need that rotation. You need that abduction, adduction. So we need to free up that full range of motion that, that your joints are capable of. And then from there, what we'll do is we'll, we'll take a look at that. Like, okay, we can now get you through that full range of motion. Let's do these you know, lightweight, more body weight drills to stabilize that range of motion, um, get you to be able to control it. And then that's when we start to add in the strength. 
Yeah, it seems like a very logical progression. You got to you have to be able to achieve a, a range of motion before you can be stable in that range yeah. of motion. You have to be stable in that range of motion before you can gain you know maximum strength within that range of motion. So it seems like a very logical way to do it. Yeah. I just think the conventional model, and you hear it all the time, was like. I, I don't get it. I stretch all the time. It's like exactly you stretch, you stretch to an end range of motion that you can't control. Stability, I think, is the tributary out of that cycle that a lot of people don't understand because they don't understand the difference between, like, uh, anatomically loading a muscle correctly, but neurologically loading it as well. Like this idea of stimulus being like a currency. Like we're close enough to San Diego or to to Mexico that I could. You know, I could walk in some places in Chula Vista with pesos. I'm sure they'd take it, but I'd have to give more pesos. It's like if I could have that direct transfer, that that one-to-one -one exchange rate of neurologically and anatomically loading a muscle. Like, it's it's stability. I think is really misunderstood because when people think stability, they think we're going to program like BOSU walls. It's like no, no, no. We don't need extra physiological range of motion to resist force at these end ranges that we create through our mobility. It's like stand on one leg. Stand on one leg at Whole Foods. Hold your grocery bag at one hand. See how long you can do it for. All right, now hinge forward. Right, deviating your center of mass outside of a limited base of support. That's all you need to do. You don't need extra physiological stimulus of stability because it's not dependent on weight. Right, like things that work in a rotational plane are not beholden to the forces of gravity that come down on them. Right, like our quads and our hamstrings, they need to be strong. Right, but if our glute med can't keep those femurs stable enough, they're not going to be able to be strong, and then you're going to, you know, you're going to blow your ACL. You're not going to be able your hamstring. You're not going to be able to retain your tibia. You're going to blow your ACL. So it's like, I think stability is really what we pride ourselves on, and it's the it's dynamic correspondence. Like we look at programming these exercises, like the way we look at programming for weaknesses in our lift. Mm. Like if I come off a, a deadlift and it's like I, you know, I'm slow off the floor. Um, I think I'm weak in my quads. I'll, I'll put together a couple cycles of like, you know, safety bar squatting or high bar squatting. These accessory movements that'll build what I think to be my main weakness. But it's like, let's look bigger picture here. Like a lot of powerlifters, I'm going to stay in my vein here. Where it's like your elbows are going to hurt three weeks out from a meet because your intensity and your frequency of squatting is going to go up. Well, if you don't have that external rotation abduction of the shoulder, you're going to be generating torque here because you can't generate mobility here. So you're going to try and rotate through a hinge. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to end up with these blown out elbows, and it's like, oh, man, I, I can lock out my bench. I'm going to hit triceps for the next, like, six weeks. So then it doesn't mean anything. This is your rate limiter. This shoulder mobility is your rate limiter. And then go down that line of, like, mobility, stability, strength there. Now you're actually making, like, tangible, measurable changes. And that's what we're after is, like, Again, don't get better at our workouts to get better at our workouts. Get better at our workouts, we can see more numbers on the platform. We can see less time in a wad. So that's kind of like wearing that athlete's hat allows us to kind of increase the buy-in because the metrics we're chasing are they're, they're subjective improvements, but if you can give them an objective point at the end, then they're hooked. Mm. In, in the CrossFit space, especially mobility and, and strength are talked about a lot. Stability, not so much. So, can can you dig more into stability? Like, how do you how do you assess if someone is unstable, sure. whether whether globally or or locally? And then also, what do you do about it? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's uh, what I see uh, in. I mean, I do see some CrossFitters. Uh, it's sh shoulders and hips are the big ones because they have the most freedom of movement, right? So it, stability is the body's capability to resist force, right? And where strength is the body's ability to uh, exert force. So like. Whenever I see like the rotator cuff strengthening, it's like, yeah, that's fine, but that's a currency. We're not loading the neurological stimulus needed to that, for that muscle to actually adapt to what it wants, right? Like it takes to unstable positions like a sponge. That's what the rotator cuff's meant to do. Um, I mean, basic movement assessments. I really like the kettlebell bottom under press because it's um, people like the idea that I don't need to have to advance the movement. Once I get the movement, it's down, and then when I increase the weight that's increasing the stimulus of instability. So they see that objective progression where some of the banded stuff gets a little um, maybe abstract for people to buy into. Then you need to progress from one banded movement to something that looks a little different. I mean, to me, it's like, I use this example a thousand times. You're probably sick of me <laughs> saying this, but imagine you probably. had a <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like most things. Uh, we I don't, don't know what you're about to say, but I'm sick of it. <laughs> we, don't, we don't talk. <laughs> we only talk in podcast form. <laughs> like, we don't talk and just silence the whole Silent way here. Car I mean, I, I've said this a thousand yeah. times over, but I mean, I, ask, I pose this question to a lot of my patients with shoulder pain, but I can extrapolate out the, the underlying principle. It's like, if I give you a dynamometer, a grip strength measure, and I put it in your hand, Right, and I have you kind of elbow at 90, shoulder at neutral, and I have you squeeze as hard as you can. And we take the reading and we do the same thing overhead. Mm. 
factoring in, you know, fatigue, whatever we can do it the next day. If you want, I don't really care. I'm, I'm like, when do you th- like, where do you think you're going to have a stronger reading? And most people intuitively go here and, you know, they think center of gravity or something, but it, anatomically we think, okay, most muscles or the majority of muscles that are really going to dictate that grip are going to be from that medial epicondyle and down, right? Intrinsic muscles, the hand and so forth. So why do you think here and here, like you see them do it, they close their eyes and they get up here and you can see they're not squeezing as hard. So it's that, it's a conversation between the brain and the body where it's like your body wants to be stable. That's why it takes to these exercises so well. So if you think of stability as this value of 100%, that always has to be appeased or your body's going to find ways to make it feel like it's stable. Because at unstable end ranges, that's where you're going to get hurt. So if we take this value of 100%, we break it up into two separate facets, right? Structure and function. It's like right now, I mean, I could come at Junta and I hit him like that. I could break his collarbone or separate his AC joint. But no, <laughs> so way. No, no way. No way. No, no, no. no. Yeah. But, the, but <laughs> got structure, steel frame. Structurally. <laughs> the, the, the Bruce Lee one-inch punch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but structurally, I mean, his glenohumeral joint's in a very stable position, right? Like, But if I wanted to dislocate his shoulder, I brought him here. Now we've traded that structure for function. But when we are under load, our body keeps like an inventory, an active trade off of like, okay, we're trading off um, structural stability for mobility. And the shoulder is a good example because I can't get my hip over or my foot over my head. So as we come up, we're trading off that structure for function. But if we haven't trained the function of that dynamic stability, that ability to resist force at these less and less structurally stable positions, and our body can't get that value of 100%. So that's what happens here. It's like the governor, you know, a golf cart. Have you ever jammed a water bottle in there and really opened her up? No. <laughs> really? It's on, <laughs> my, it's, it's now, now on my list. This is Come what on, they do. dude. This is what they do I would have Canada. thought, like, I wasn't even looking at you. I was like, this guy's definitely, <laughs> definitely done, done that. <laughs> uh, no, I, but it's, I mean, I've flipped one before, but... You did it? Oh, dude. Well, yeah. Okay, maybe you shouldn't do that because <laughs> you might, like, really hurt yourself. But it's like, it's stability is the governor to strengthen our body, right? It's really, it automates the nervous system and it controls the nervous system so we can limit the amount of damage we do to ourselves, right? Like the structural stability you're loading here is labrum, right? And you're, or you're just full dislocation, right? It takes very little to, I mean, that's why anterior dislocations are so common based off the structure of the shoulder. When you're in this position, and if you haven't trained this to be if stable. If you're listening, he's in an overhead position. Okay. Oh, see, I'm just seeing this <laughs> thing. For so, the, I mean. Well, it's funny. Go, how often? Go watch, he's been demoing <laughs> yeah. the whole time. Go watch the video. <laughs> how, often, how often do we like air quote on the podcast? And people are like, man, they never see anything. We're probably just yeah. like, we sound like we're being facetious, but we're not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, if you train that stability in that end range, then your body should allow for a f- free flow of strength through there because it's not worried about having to protect joints. Like, um, just a simple one is hatch a band around the back of your fingers attach the band at uh, at shoulder height and then do a press overhead you'll see people as they trade off it starts to shake and they start to bias that internal rotation because the end goal is to get it back to that structural stability right so that's i mean mm. you ask for a test that's a pretty <laughs> detailed <laughs> answer but that, yeah, that's more perfect. <laughs> let me let me give you a more straightforward yeah one. that's what he does <laughs> i work in the crossfit world so um i work with athletes from, of all different levels um there you go yeah there we go so um it's pretty simple. An overhead squat can tell you a lot about someone's body. There's, I'm sure you guys have seen those charts where it's like mobility here, stability here, and it starts at the ankle and it switches all the way up to you know your shoulders, your elbows, whatever. Um, it's it's pretty true. No matter who you are, what it is, um, those certain joints with larger ranges of motion, they're gonna need more stability, right? Um, like Jordan said, that elbow joint, it's a hinge joint. There's not much range of motion there. Yeah, we can flex, extend, but there's no rotation, abduction, adduction. Um, those joints are gonna need more stability. Uh, yeah, they're going to need more structural or structural stability. So that's the idea, is that in an overhead squat, you can predict these things. And you can see it, you can take a novice athlete and an advanced athlete, and you can tell a very real difference in the way that they move based on how these joints are functioning, right? If we can rotate through those hips, we have full range of motion. We could stabilize and keep those knees in line with our ankles. Um, that's going to allow for a better upper body position, right? Um, if we have enough flexibility in that upper back and our spine, then we're going to be able to get those shoulders overhead, get that rotation, stack them in good position. So um, my favorite movement is I'll start with just a body weight squat with a, a deconditioned athlete so I can see how they move. If they can control their hips, if they can't do it, they're probably not going to be able to control their upper body in an overhead squat. So there's no no real need to take it there yet. Um, you can work those two separately. But someone that's more intermediate, that's that's a great way to test how your body is functioning. It's just by can you do an overhead squat properly and stay in a strong position. So 
That's my favorite test. Yeah. I mm-hmm. think your acuity for, for assessing squats in the overhead is, like, it's way beyond mine. Like, you no, know, it's a bit like... <laughs> Powerlifters don't put much well, stuff no, over I, their head. Well, that's not the thing. Like, I mean, arms. I can... I'm not even going to try because this guy's in my face. But, <laughs> no, like, I think... Uh, I mean, because I upper lower, I think for a lot of people, at least, and this is more to the powerlifting vein, that, I mean, we want to talk functional fitness. We spoke off camera about, like, uh, just the idea of functional fitness and how that's kind of a buzzword but i mean define your function right well i like to go back let's let's go anthropological right what is our function squat de- squat and deadlift is a, a function like primal movement but like one foot in front of the other fellas like let's bring it right back to coming out of the sea sort of thing so i think assessing the gait cycle is is really huge and that's part of um, one of the assessments that we do a lot is okay, let's do a lunge right and like because the, the range of motion of the squat is a range of motion of an exercise, not a range of motion of a joint, right? So let's let's put a, a dab of pain on the top of that femur head inside, and I want I want Sistine Chapel inside of that acetabulum by the time that warm up's done. I want the foot on the ground because I want that because this is how the glute meat functions. That Jane Fonda crap that's uh, that's not going to fly anymore. We're not we're not dealing with you know Sunday living room athletes. We're dealing with like real people that have to have a solid base of support. So I mean someone comes to me and they're they're applying strength to something that needs to be stable it's like no 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 like this is how like it stops that lateral shift when you heel strike right usain bolt would be an awful 100 meter runner if every time his heel struck he was here now all of a sudden he's running four less strides every or four more strides every race than four less because he's like a six foot eight gazelle so put someone through a full range long stride lunge get them to come up hinge open up and just have all that movement come from the hip and then from there like if you can get that and this is just because i'm not as acutely aware of these (laughs) patterns like he sees like just matrix numbers comes in front of his face like he just goes total rain man when he's like assessing something <laughs> but it's like I, I don't have that acuity i'm afraid to move yeah <laughs> oh yeah he's judging the hell out of you you know he ju- he, 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 he lines you up the second he's like a movement tailor can, can you tell what i'm hurting right now just punch him in the face i don't know <laughs> is it right low back <laughs> you point at my left it's my right yeah so you're left <laughs> <laughs> you're left low back yeah left lower back is it really left hip yeah He's like, he's like, oh shit! That's weird. See, you see what I'm saying? Though? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh jeez, we got this on camera too. Uh, <laughs> no, but I think I think it's a good assessment again for buy-in, where it's like, you're like, oh no, I'm like, I do stability, you know, we'll do the hip circle and all that. It's like, okay, let's see what you do, and it's just like, boom, Valgus comes in, hips sh- like pull the lumbar spine forward. They come up, they got like that baby giraffe knee, and then you try and get them in a hinge, and it's just it's it's just a mess. And it's like then it's like okay, if we can calibrate for that like if i'm if i wanted to shoot you i could be 20 30 degrees off and still hit you if i wanted to pick the side view mirror off that escalade it's like now i need to really dial in my sights at that that distant trajectory but anything within that you're going to be bullseye every time right so i think for from an assessment standpoint of i mean anyone listening it's like go through that if you think if you think you're worth your salt from a stability standpoint long stride and athletic lunge get the knee over the toe externally rotate that hip to stabilize that knee in that deep hip flex position then see how you do. See if you can keep that knee locked the entire time, and just like use a mirror if you have to. But ideally, you want to learn how to com- you want to learn how to do the movement, not learn how to fix the movement, right? And I think that's a lot of things when you take people out from a squat rack and you take them out of that commercial gym and they don't have that nice big picture frame mirror in front of them, and you got to squat out here. They don't know, right? So I think being able to hardwire these motor patterns is the biggest thing that we try and carry over, and that's why we are loading these movements directly after isolating these joint stability issues. Um, yeah, let's take a break real quick. When we come back, I want to talk about uh, thing, other tests that people can do that would show that they may not have stability. Cool. Thanks for watching the show. If you'd like to learn more about how to improve your snaps, clean and jerk, we have a free 55 page ebook you can get at flightweightlifting.com. It has sampled programming specifically for weightlifting, uh, weightlifting how to technique videos, and other tips on how to improve all of your lifts. Go to flightweightlifting.com and you can download that ebook for free. Download it now. <laughs> we're back with Jordan and Jordan. <laughs> uh, what were we talking about? Stability. <laughs> stability, yeah. You guys have your, your model of mobility, stability, and then and then strength. Uh, we've covered a lot of that, but uh, I'd still love to hear more about uh, stability and, and how you guys assess that and how you uh, help people become stable. Well, I'm curious, too, is anyone who's listening or watching this, something they can do and go, oh, fuck, I'm unstable as fuck. Yeah. All right, you were talking about the bottoms up kettlebell press. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I definitely notice a, a discrepancy between my right and left when I do that. 
Right, I'm just like boom, boom, boom. Left, I'm like, oh, there's a problem yeah. here. Well, I think I think Jordans are like uh, Jordan uh, Junta. <laughs> Junta. Thing one and thing two, yeah, it's about dude. Uh, three and a half, four years of school of like Jordan, and both of us go, yeah, oh, yep, oh yep. okay. Uh, <laughs> no, I think one thing that like Jordan really kind of breaks a paradigm on is the idea of like spinal rigidity. Um, a lot of people, you know, it's it's what is it, December, and we could easily go to the beach right now, so they go after the aesthetics. And the way Jordan loads, because he gets a lot of our Olympic lifting athletes, a lot of people who are going to be deviating that combined center of gravity of the athlete and the load so far out of their base of support that the midline strength is like, I mean, that's kind of his wheelhouse when it comes to that. Yeah. Me and Mike were just talking about if you want to get a strong midline, you just grab a sandbag or an Atlas Stone or something, you hold onto it, you walk with it, mm -hmm. or you put something heavy over your head, you walk, you lunge with it. That stuff will give you a, a strong core. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question, something people can do at home to see how unstable they are. I think one of the greatest things we found, we see it with people squat 600 pounds. They can't stand on one leg. So, yeah, he's doing it already. He knows mm -hmm. what I'm going to say. It's the single leg RDL, right? Mm -hmm. So can you shift your weight onto one leg and control that enough to bring yourself into full flexion and extension, that trunk? Only in so yoga class, man. I'm just <laughs> like... There you go. You know what? The, the, the tree pose is the one I can't do. But is that a real thing? The tree pose. Yeah, the tree okay. pose. Yeah, like, I don't know where your hands are. I feel, I feel like this, right is, a, this yeah. is a good divide. <laughs> yeah. You guys stand yeah. our side. We originally thought it was going to be more like this, but now I think we're really You guys go kick each other in the head. <laughs> we'll we have a unified front on this side. That's yeah. where we'll all the strength is. <laughs> oh, they are, on average, we're, we're much stronger than you guys. <laughs> <I'm fine>. uh, <laughs> it's not skewed to one side. No, 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 no. <laughs> but yeah, no, I think the single leg RDL is a really good test. Um, it's fantastic. What's another one we use? Um, oh, I think a principle that I think a lot of people should take away with. How did we forget about this? Um, using resistance to progress the stimulus of instability, right? And so the kettlebell bottom under press is a great example. But when you know Jordan talked about the single leg RDL, mm -hmm. again, I'm going to revert back to the powerlifting community. But uh, something that I get from the Gen Pop community as well is like, okay, do you, do you load single leg? We'll get some bodybuilders. Oh, yeah, single leg leg press. Like, no, no, no. You're externalizing that need for stability to the apparatus. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, no, I do like um, Bulgarian split squats. Oh, okay, right. good. All right, so we've got the rear foot elevated on the box. Um, yeah, uh, I, like, hold on to the Smith machine. It's like, ah, oh, no, it's, again, externalizing. Yeah. Or you'll get some people that get pretty close, but now we're dumbbell each hand, right? Mm -hmm. Foot's back on the bench, dumbbells in each hand. It's like, well, let's try and take th – you're, you're not going to be able to – Bulgarian split squat as much as you can back squat, right? You're not going to be able to load this as a strength exercise because you're already self-limiting by the parameters of the exercise. So why not lean more into the unstable loading parameters and just put a dumbbell in one hand? Now we're well, now that's hard. Exactly, <laughs> and it won't but look nearly as impressive yeah. to the girl on the other side of the gym. Exactly, and you're probably going to fall on your face. So yeah. I think just grunt a little yeah. more. Yeah, as, as, a, as a general category, more neon clothes. Yeah. <laughs> as a general category, asymmetric loading almost implies that there's going to be a stability component. Yeah, yeah, and I think in almost every case that over and that really simplifies it. Doesn't no matter which hand I'm in. It does, depending on the stimulus you're trying to adapt for. So this comes out of like Liebenson's work, Stu McGill's work, like the, I mean, we're going to go deep into those like anatomy geeks, but like mm -hmm. if I'm, if I'm loading the stance leg in a Bulgarian split squat, I'm going to load that cross pattern of this glute med and contralateral QL. Mm -hmm. This is going to be keeping me laterally stable through the pelvis and the QL on the back is going to be keeping me laterally stable through the lumbar spine. So if we have a deficiency, like you know, with patients in the office, I'll look at wear patterns of the shoe. That'll dictate like an early heel strike and probably an instability on the other side. So we'll look at that and then we'll load that and we'll test it. It's like, all right, if put, you know, right foot forward, do that. And that'll have like the scuffed heel of the shoe. And that's usually stable. And they think it's their right hip. It's like, oh, wow, you found something on my right shoe. It's probably my right hip. It's like, no, no, no. You're, when you're going through that gait cycle, this hip is dropping out. Then as you go through that swing phase, you're hitting early. And that's why you're, you know, oh, you're burning yeah. out the bottom of that shoe. Mm -hmm. So then when you load that left side, dumbbell and left hand, now this is the adaptation we're trying to make long term. Mm -hmm. right? This is the stability of that pattern. So again, with that principle being said, everything works, nothing works every time. So if I was you know, Instagram and all this and, and YouTube and podcasting, you become sound bites. So you say this and then people only vehemently just load this one side forever. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, no, there's also like another pattern that you can go or you can switch loads halfway in between. And so for me, just using that resistance to progress to the stimulus of instability, but pairing it with uh, an exercise selection that's going to 
push you further into that stimulus of instability. So that's where mm-hmm. kind of the progressions get to get fun because you can start playing around with, you know, the top switch hands or at the bottom switch hands or, and that goes for anything, lunging, single leg RDLs, Bulgarian split squats, any unilateral loaded movement, upper or lower. So if you have a person that, that they really just can't handle being on one leg, so doing single leg unsupported supported movements where you're truly on one leg, like single leg RDLs or pistols or trump squats or whatever it happens to be, is just way too hard. Do you progress them through something like step ups or like a reverse lunge where you're t- kind of temporarily just on one leg before the other leg becomes in, into contact and gives you more support? Jordan's looking at Jordan really funny. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely, I mean. because I, I love those things. Um, something you can do both legs on the ground where you're still going to get that unilateral stability is a lateral lunge or a walking lunge, uh, even a stationary lunge. All those things. Step ups are fantastic for loading into those glutes and drilling that stability. Um, as, as long as you're you're drilling it in strong strong movement patterns and um, you're loading into that muscle, it's there's going to be benefit to it. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think understanding that scaling stimulus is more than resistance, right? And it's more than just weight. It's range of motion is big, right? Like my knee hurts when we get to a certain point. It's like, all right, we just won't go to that certain point. But now we have, we have a gem, we have a jewel, we have an objective outcome measure of progress. Something about like, you know, we talked earlier about, oh, you know, you go see a physician that isn't a lifter. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, just don't squat. Like, oh, okay. All right. I'm just going to go crawl in a hole and die then. But you have someone that's like, okay, no, you can squat. But I, I know that feeling, by the way. I, yeah. I, I, I went to a, to a guy one time because I had, I had neck pain, I had back pain, I had elbow pain, I had shoulder pain, and I got full body x-rays, and I was like, I was all messed up towards the end of my MMA career. And I went to a guy, and he, he like, asked me a few questions, like, you hurt? Oh, how's this feel? Bend over, touch your toes. And he looked at me, and, like, word for word, he said, you ever thought about just hanging it up? <laughs> like, you want to just, like, you just <laughs> never do it again? Uh-huh. And I, I thought he was going to go, I'm just, I'm just joking. Yeah. Don't no punch punch it. Joke. No, nothing. And no. I was like oh, like that's like, that's where we go from here. Yeah. Like, avoiding I will, I will provo- find a new doctor. <laughs> <Yeah>. Avoiding <laughs> provocation isn't treatment, and I think that's only going to be something that's exemplified by people who would rather die than not lift, right? And that's, that's uh, and you know, you had an unfortunate, a very unfortunate ankle injury earlier in the year. <laughs> spike ball related. Spike oh, ball, many man. a death <laughs> attributed to spike you ball. N- you never get yeah. hurt, like, <laughs> it's never. training or competing. <laughs> it's... Spike, spike ball. ball. Yeah. Uh, no. Everything I do but is 110%. <laughs> <laughs> he was laying out for it. But no, like. It's all right. My wife broke her wrist playing beer pong once. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe y'all should meet. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they shouldn't. Uh, no, but I don't think he, I don't think he missed, I don't think he missed a lift. I mean, he. I was on a small off squat program less than a month out from my ankle injury. So, I mean, maybe not doing full CrossFit, not the Olympic lifts, the stuff that I like doing, but. I was doing something. Yeah. And the hardest thing for a crossfitter to do is is rest. <laughs> I can give you 30 exercises. They'll do every single one on the list, but they will not rest for one day. So That's true. Yeah. Yeah, I just think that ability to scale stimulus and understand that, like, stimulus is just – it's the currency, right? It's how we make transactions from, from afferent to efferent. So I think understanding the input, we can then gauge for the output. So if, like – if it's, oh, it hurts to do this, okay, then we can regress, we can regress, we can regress, and we're just moving further along that spectrum. If you're hurt, we're going to move more passive or move shorter ranges of motion, and if you're on the up, then we're going to make those progressions of time under tension or uh, progressions of stability or progressions of uh, sets or volume or intensity. It's like there's a thousand, honestly, I don't even think I can name all of the stimulus that are out there. Like someone could probably fill in the list for me. It's just like trying to really hone in on individual ones and then almost undulate or wave. Like, okay, we're going to drop the intensity down, but we're going to bring the volume up or we're going to, you know, we're going to put you on one leg or, I mean, even these, like if you're trying to get back into strengthening movements, we'll program bilaterally loaded Bulgarian split squats because the you know if they're post op ACL it's like okay they're gonna need stability and that's gonna be their rate limiting factor but they still wanna you still need to have quad strength you still need to have hamstring strength to help retain that tibia so it's like all right we're gonna blow you out in a long stride that'll be one progression we'll start you like a little narrower then we're gonna start to load the hamstring as you go further and then we're gonna add some resistance and then so it's just getting to play with it it's almost like you get to orchestrate like for each individual their own little their own little like their own little song or did you just get put all the pieces together and when it all comes together and they can move again it's like oh, mm. yes do you, do you have you, you might have already touched on this but do you know any methods where you accomplish improving mobility stability and strength kind of all in one go all at the same time huh. overhead squat <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> i mean that's not a bad answer yeah. <laughs> 
Um, it's just regressing the movements is a, is a big part of it. Um, taking them into their pieces. So maybe they're not doing an overhead squat. Maybe it starts with an overhead walk. Or we move into a front rack lunge or something like that. Where you're taking these stability drills and you're starting to, to load them in a way that is conducive to them building strength. That's going to transfer over to that end goal of the overhead squat. Um, but you're doing it in pieces. So it's not... We're just going to overhead squat until we're good at it because that's not going to work, right? That's like me saying I'm going to max out my back squat every day because it's going to make me strong. Um, I'm going to do these little pieces of stability and move through as full a range of motion as I can until it gets better, 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 and then eventually, hey, look, I can do an overhead squat. Well, I think so to that point, um, the idea, too, that I mean, we're not just a corrective exercise-based company. We're also – a main focus of ours from a prevention standpoint is exercising correctly that when we scale the stimulus yes. to the point when you're back loading it's like okay let's have this now be like walking lunges yeah do it load it load it as a resistance exercise it's i mean it's good to keep your hips open but you can also put size on your quads if that's your goal or what i see a lot with like uh, bodybuilders struggle with like thoracic extension so do dumbbell pullovers Get, get just, uh, your strength. Mm -hmm. So like mobility, stability, and strength. There you go. You know, if you want to do pecs, we're going to, we're going to flare the elbows out. If you want to load lats, we're going to externally rotate the shoulders and try and keep that neutral wrist or, um, yeah. Oh, uh, so that's a great movement. That's not using the cross the space very much. No. Yeah. And you know what I was on and you guys don't like to bench press either. Maybe that's the, uh, I, but I don't think you guys maybe not need it as much because I keep saying you guys, like he's talking you about. You guys. <laughs> I don't, don't take kindly. No. Um, <laughs> but you guys spend so much time overhead that, mm. Uh, it's going to be a lot more prevalent that there's an issue that needs to be cleared up where it's like, if this is the plane of motion that I'm working in in a horizontal press, then, you know, at some point an injury could be apparent, but I'm not loading this range of motion. So it's like, okay, I like keeping overhead presses in from a corrective standpoint as a, as a gatekeeper of like, okay, if I have having shoulder pain here, it's common. It's common to my bench press is this is going to be my limited range of motion moving forward. Something as simple as like dead hangs when you do your pull-ups, like cueing someone in that, like, again, reverting more to the bodybuilding community that trying to keep that constant tension in the lats. It's like mm -hmm. pain in the anterior shoulder in bodybuilding. First place I go is like the Terry's minor, right? Because when you're in that dead hang, you're actually internally rotated. So you need to actually externally rotate first to load into the lats, which are internal rotators. So we're going to set here first, elbows to the front of the room. And that's the teres minor. So that's a stability muscle first, locking in that humerus into the scapula so our lats can do the work. But what do bodybuilders do? They stay in the lats the whole time. So you have a really dominant internal rotator that's creating such an imbalance at that glenohumeral joint because they're not allowing that to unhinge, lock, go. Because that's your rate limiter. Because that's why people don't do it. It's like, oh, yeah, I could stay here for, I don't know, however many reps. But if I had a dead hang with my teres, obviously isn't as strong as my lats. But I want to look cool at the gym and stringers and all that, and catch a pump and eat pop tarts post workout. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm just gonna <laughs> live in the dream. Live in, hey, I'm in SoCal, man. Let me live it. Um, so I'm gonna stay, and that's the imbalance. So outside of, I mean, this is more towards the realm of our personalized coaching. It's having the foresight and the ability to actually then set forth a plan to, okay, we've done the corrective exercise. We've gone through a distillation process of what stimulus needs to be loaded for your condition based off your loading parameters, like the demands of your workout. Now, how do we stop this from happening again? And how do we use like the information we have of people that do what you do and the pitfalls that they then see? Because it's like, you know, uh, it's, it's not a mistake unless it happens again, right? So if we can correct it, but then we got to chart like, okay, where's, where's the next one coming? Where's the next leak in the pipe kind of thing? So that's, I think, something that we really focus on from a personalized standpoint. It's like when you're done, you're never done, right? Because you're never just going to stop. There's no such thing as done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, once, once we go flat line and I'm six feet in the ground, then we're done. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I'm doing more corrective exercises and having to shore up deficiencies and stuff like that more than ever yeah and it's like some some of what i'm doing is barbell work and cross like cross stuff that looks like crossfit or something like that but more and more is corrective work now is that stemming from like neglect in the past yep okay yeah all right yeah so, so learn your lesson kids. about three years in recovery yeah. here yeah. Each, <laughs> each, <laughs> we, i think he gets a medallion right that's how it works he gets his three-year medallion <laughs> i'm almost done i think i'm done it's a 12-step yeah. program yeah. i've heard yeah. yeah no i mean that's the thing it's like get it get on it early right because you don't yeah. it's you're gonna be in that body for the rest of your life so yeah the more you take care of it now the better it's gonna be to you later i think mm -hmm. if yeah and if you start throwing band-aids on things or avoiding things like 
the band-aids one day are going to yeah. be stitches the next day that's kind of <laughs> your option as far as like you have like a spectrum of stimulus passive we move you to active if we push the active too far or it's unstable then we move past this spectrum that we want to be in into this i mean i compare it almost to like the electromagnetic spectrum like we have our visible field and then we have on one side like x-rays and one side like or microwaves and another side like ionizing gamma rays or whatever so it's like this is surgery over here this is where you need to go back go back to start from go don't collect 200 dollars. this is sort of the game and then you got to work your way back and the idea is to stay dead center in that spectrum so when you start deviating too far one way or even the other because like I think the idea that people think that oh more mobility, less injury prevention, it's like everything is an inverted bell curve, right? The the likelihood of injury is gonna end or is gonna be just as high on that one side as on the other, right? So we, you take someone who's like the yogi super flexible contortionist and he's gonna he's gonna have issues. You're gonna take the, the power lifter, can't tie his shoes, he's gonna have issues too. So it's like staying centered regardless of your discipline is gonna give you the less the least amount of pain and probably the greatest amount of performance too, right? Yeah, our friend Joe Miller, uh, she's you know deep into the, into the yoga world and has been doing that that type of thing for a long time and is is very very mobile. And after a while uh, of, of doing all that, she started to have some problems and she came into the CrossFit space. You know, I'm, I'm oversimplifying all this, p- putting words in her mouth in, in a lot of ways, but she came into the CrossFit space, added some strength to um, to her current background and, and ended up being a lot healthier because of it. Now ha- now really promotes strength for everyone, of course, but especially for people that were in her situation where it was all range of motion, all soft tissue work, um, just trying to achieve positions but not being stable or strong in those positions. And uh, I don't know many people that have gone that far down that, that path where they're just mobile but they're, they didn't focus on, on strength. Uh, but, it, but it certainly happens. It happened yeah. in her case. It might be something we see a lot is people think they can stretch their way out of everything. Right, and that's well, it. I mean, that's a common thing. Someone goes, "Oh, this hurts. What's the stretch?" Yeah, I'm like, there's probably not a stretch yeah. for that. Or what? Where do I put the lacrosse ball? Is another one. It's like, where do yeah. I put my? Can I put a band around something? Yeah. <laughs> what is where, it? Where's that jigsaw I had, <laughs> honey? Where's the jigsaw? I just got to put a like a wine cork in it and just just like, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's. I mean, it's the industry we're in. It's it's everything has to be superlative, bigger, better, faster, stronger, right? And then every now and then you need the accountability of like, no, no, here, here's the plan. This is what we're gonna do. Yeah, I realized I'd gone too far at one point when I was. <clears throat> Had a band wrapped around my neck. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You, you yeah, were you in like Thailand <laughs> or something like that? <laughs> yeah. That's getting uh, clogged like, in a dark room with yeah. we're wearing an eye mask. So I think uh, things got weird. Ball gag in your really? Mouth. Yeah, the, the heels didn't give it away for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. They spit on me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Wow. Oh, man. All right, let's wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. think on our podcast, we would go with, on that note, on the that worst note, segue of all time. <laughs> my safety word is. Yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Where can uh, people find you guys? Um, you can find us at, uh, we're on Instagram, pre underscore script. Uh, our website is www.pre-script.com. I'm on Instagram, the functional Cairo. Jordan. The underscore muscle underscore doc. I got to change that. <laughs> uh, no, yeah. No, it's um, good. It RX fits. Radio on iTunes that's and right. Spotify. Uh, so it's RX apostrophe, apostrophe D Radio. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, let's yeah, we'll give you the, my home address if you'd like. You guys want to stop by. <laughs> but yeah. A- anything else you want to mention before we go? Um, don't neglect the small stuff. It's yeah. uh, mobility, stability, strength. That's It's a pretty straightforward model. Uh, move through full range of motion. Do it often. Do it with intent. Do it with intent. Um, that's how you stay healthy. Yeah. yeah so. I think the intent is, is everything. Yeah. So. Yeah, we're good. Appreciate cool. you guys having Thanks us for joining us right. today. Yeah. Thanks for having Thanks us, guys. Awesome. Make sure you go over to YouTube, hit the subscribe button, and go over to iTunes. Subscribe there as well. Five star comment. Five star comment. Five, Five star review. Yeah. Five and star review a and a positive <laughs> comment, Very or positive. we'll come hunt you down. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks. All right, thank you. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the show. If you like the show, which I know you did, please go share it on Facebook, Instagram, or whatever social media channel you happen to be loving at the moment. Pinterest, Twitter, Tumblr. Tumblr. Share it on Tumblr. Next on Barbell Strike, we talked about Brett Contreras, the glute guy, and he's going to teach us how to build bigger butts. Bam. Boom.